Hey everybody, long time no see. It's Andrew Fantasia here on Digital Charcuterie and welcome to another video uh, where we chart the long but wonderful uh, progress of our wait for Marvel United Multiverse. And obviously since the last time we've talked, that has been a while, some new developments have come up in the United world in general. So that's what we're going to talk about today. First of all, you know, the YouTube drill, if you want to like us and click thumbs and subscribe to those thumbs after the bell rings, there's there's an order to that. I might not be getting it right, but you know what I mean. Are you a Marvel fan? Then welcome aboard. Are you a DC fan? Then stick around. Are you a fantasy fan? You might think that's unrelated, but in fact, it's very related because I am a self-published fantasy author. And if you think you might enjoy my books, why don't you go check them out? They're on Amazon right now. They're called We Were Wizards, and they're a classic fantasy adventure with lots of twists and turns and very, very just fun with swords and magic, right? That's, that's why we write these kinds of things. Book one is called Seekers of the Stones. The second book is also available. It's called Ghosts of Wizards Past. You can find We Were Wizards on Amazon right now in three different formats. So check it out if you're a fantasy fan or you know somebody who is. All right, plugs over. Apologies for how long it's been since our last video. Uh, this time of year is a very, very busy time of year at work for me. Thankfully, that has ended and now everything is back to normal and I can come back and make more videos for all of you where we talk about our favorite board game. So we're going to talk a little bit Marvel United, we're going to talk a lot of bit DC United, and then we're going to wrap things up with another round of our game that we play here called What's That Movie? So let's start with Marvel United Multiverse, the thing we are all patiently tapping our foot like the Sonic the Hedgehog, you know, just, just, just waiting, waiting for that to come rolling in. Thankfully, even though it's seen setback after setback, it looks like, and I'm going to cross my fingers, and I'm going to knock on wood, because I don't want to jinx it, but it looks like things are starting to roll out of the factory. I say the word things. That, that the Pledges. That's, that's the more professional way to say it. The pledges are starting to roll out of the factory. In fact, one person, I believe in China, which geographically makes total sense, has already received their full pledge. That bodes well for all of us. A rising tide lifts all ships, right? So hopefully it helps lift all the ships crossing the Pacific so that containers can get to all the, uh, the people who pledged in the States or here in Canada or in South America and, you know, get those ships to Europe too, get those ships to Australia, to Africa, to everybody who ordered this game so that everybody can enjoy it and get their little mitts on all those minis and just have fun with it. So from the looks of things, people in the States can expect a late summer delivery. People in Australia can expect an early summer delivery. So Meeple Monkey, I'm looking forward to that unboxing video, buddy. I can't wait to see it. Uh, people in Canada, however, we are N A. We we don't know yet uh, when we're going to see some movement with those pledges. We're still kind of up in the air, which is weird. You know, you'd think they, I mean, Canada's population is pretty small compared to America's population. You think they would kind of lump us in with the American ones and just send it all out. But I guess we had a lot of orders in Canada. So cool. I'm glad that means they're, that Simon's doing well there. That means that we could possibly get a season four. But I digress. That is the status of Marvel United Multiverse, is that it is slowly but surely trucking its way, boating its way, I should say, along to the people who ordered it. So now it's just a matter of being more patient. I'm going to guess, ideal, well, I mean, ideally, the game would be on my doorstep tomorrow. But if all goes smoothly and there is no further delay on the end of the factory or what have you, I'm going to guess that Folks in Canada, we are going to receive our pledges early October. That's that's where I feel is the safest place to put my, my money. When the leaves start turning brown and the air starts getting crisp and we start getting in the Halloween spirit, I would say, fellow Canadians, check your front porches. Not for trick-or-treaters, but for Hobgoblin, who also has pumpkins. So... In a way, it's kind of fitting. All right, so the last time I made one of these videos by myself was so long ago that there now exists a new United 
game that didn't exist before, which is crazy to think about. Obviously, I have gone on and I've made some videos with the Meeple Monkey, and we've talked about DC United, or sorry, DC Superheroes United. I'm just going to call it DC United. We've made some videos together talking about it and our thoughts and feelings and what we hope to see. And I mean, I've made my my hypothetical three seasons of DC United last year, and the Meeple Monkey is putting together a, a bingo game with all my picks. Uh, so we're, we're still having lots of fun with that. But I haven't actually sat down by myself and talked about it to all of you uh, yet, which is kind of weird. Just that's how busy work has been. But thankfully now... We can start really digging into that DC meat. Uh, apologies to vegans everywhere. We can really start digging into that DC food. There we go. That covers all my bases. So let's take a look together at the... I want to take a look at the two dev diaries that Andrea Caravesio has posted on the DC United uh, page there on GameFound and just kind of take a quick glance and look over what he's talked about and what that might mean for us as fans and for the game at large. So let's get into it. In the first of these dev diaries, which is admittedly a couple weeks old, but this is just, I'm getting around to it now, Andrea talked about uh, just a few basic things. As longtime United fans, we are, we kind of have a shorthand, we kind of, we know the language, we understand the game really, really well, but we have to remember that because this is a fresh new IP, they are going to be speaking about it kind of almost as if it's a new thing. There's going to be a lot of stuff in here that kind of tries to draw in new fans. So we as old fans have to remember that these early dev diaries are probably less for us and more for getting new people on board. But regardless, Andrea has said, the original design of this core box comes from a couple of years ago when it was still unsure that the United System could have been applied to DC or any other license, and it had its own seminal impact on other United designs. I was so happy to come back to it once it was confirmed that the release of DC Super Heroes United had become a possibility and not just a theory. I think that means that they were waiting to see if they could get the DC license, because for him to say they're unsure that the United System could have been applied to DC, it can 100% be applied to DC. It's superheroes fighting supervillains. Like, there's no way it couldn't. Um, I think what they are struggling with uh, in the development teams is if it can be applied to other things, because I'm sure they would love, and I'm sure a lot of people would love, you know, Star Wars United or something along those lines, but can Star Wars be applied to that system? That's a little trickier. Uh, Meeple Monkey and I have talked about that and how it might or might not work. And that's something that would require a shakeup to the United System. And I don't think they want to do that if they can help it. So the very first hero Andrea wanted to design was, of course, Batman. The reason being that he's Batman. And I'm not going to go through this whole paragraph, but they have taken the idea of equipment and really just run away with it because Batman is a guy who with a lot of equipment. And I love what Andrea is saying here about how this kind of brought the equipment thing to life and what it means for the Batman character. That marked the real birth of the whole equipment mechanic. He needed to have many gadgets to choose from and an essential part of his gameplay should have been to analyze the villain's plan and come prepared to counter it. Sure, batarangs are always handy against most antagonists and a grapple gun can serve you well in several situations, but will you need extra protection or a bit more mobility? Maybe something to counter poisons or see through a clever villain's lies. Players who like to analyze, come prepared for a fight and find it rewarding to anticipate the villain's plans will immensely enjoy Batman's game options. This is going to be really cool if it's what I think it is. Because from the looks of that picture, Batman's got like six or seven pieces of equipment, right? And it would be insanely overpowering and overwhelming and a bit messy if you could have them all. So I think what's going to be the case is when you start the game as Batman, during the initial setup, you can choose three equipment pieces and only three to bring with you into the fight. To really make you feel like Batman, like he's saying, to anticipate what the villain is going to do, you'll be able to choose the equipment that best suits the villain that you're facing. So the more you get to know the way all the villains work, the more like Batman you are going to become yourself by saying, hmm, you know, we're about to go fight Kingpin. And Kingpin hops around the board a lot, so I'm going to bring my grappling hook so I can chase him and, you know, get to him as fast as possible before he achieves his plan. Or, ooh, we're going to be fighting the Vulture. Well, the Vulture is always picking up the Crisis Tokens. Let's see, do I have a, a, an equipment piece that makes me, you know, remove Crisis Tokens? I'm going to go ahead and bring that with me. So you truly become, in the setup 
the actual setup of the game, before the game even begins, they are making you feel like the hero in the setup. If that's what's happening, then Andrea, dev team, like that's so cool. The idea of taking the character setup portion of a board game and making it thematic and appropriate to that character, just bravo. I, I love that so much, if that's what's happening. And as we move down here, we see next comes his polar, or should I say solar, <laughs> opposite Superman. Kal-El doesn't need equipment. The Man of Steel is almost invulnerable and his Kryptonian physiology gives him incredible powers like flight, breath, heat vision. As unstoppable and tough to take down as he is, the Kent family's adopted son is not without weak points either. Especially at high player counts, you might not have the time to play both of his starting hand cards, providing you with an interesting strategic choice between damage protection and mobility. I'm sure we'll learn more in the future, obviously, but Superman is the hero in all of DC that I am most curious to see how they would translate here. Because how do you take somebody with Kryptonian physiology and make them a character in a game and make it so that they're not overpowered, you know? How does damage work on Superman? Can he even take damage? I just can't wait to see how they do that. And so far the Dev Diary doesn't quite give that away. They're keeping the, the cards close to the chest here, and I, I can appreciate that for now. You want to tease it out a bit. You know, I've just been thinking how they could possibly make this work. Is there going to be a kryptonite token at some point that, like, moves around the board and Superman can't go where that kryptonite is? That would be something that I think would have to be worked out in terms of the hero and not the villain. Like, the villain can't be walking around with kryptonite because if you're fighting, I don't know, Kang... Kang doesn't have kryptonite, right? So he's got a lot of crystals on his base, actually. We could lie and say one of them is kryptonite. Maybe that was a bad example. Titania definitely doesn't have kryptonite. So if Superman is fighting Titania, how is she going to pose a threat? I'm waiting on pins and needles for this. The Superman reveal of how his cards work uh, is really going to be my biggest chewy moment of learning about DC United. It's like the one thing that I think could tip the scales of this game because uh, there's a lot of Kryptonian characters like I can't have Superman without Supergirl that doesn't work for me I need them both in my life and then you have other characters who are almost just as powerful like Martian Manhunter or Jor-El or Zod right? Darkseid's a big guy too we know he's in this game how are we going to make this work we're just going to have to wait and see I uh I tried to think of some idea something profound to put forth in this video and say, hey, maybe they can do it like this. But with the exception of Superman himself coming with a kryptonite token that has to move around the board and he has to avoid it, I don't know how else they could make this work. They said that at high player counts, you won't have time to play all your cards. So maybe he only gets super powerful if you play both of his starting hand cards. So maybe you have to kind of choose, do I want to be invulnerable or do I want to be fast? I don't know, but I don't envy the developers for having to come up with a way to make Superman work in this game. I'll tell you that right now. And then finally, the Trinity wouldn't be complete without the Princess of Themyscira, Wonder Woman. By far the world's most popular female superhero, Diana the Amazon Princess, is the most versatile hero in this core set. Makes sense. She's got a lot of equipment and she's got a lot of raw power. So she's like a mix between Batman and Superman. And I mean, her mini is probably the coolest looking mini. I love that she's got a cape. I love her shield, her sword, the chibi art, which has been beautiful in every United game. United is the most beautiful looking board game I think ever made. And this art is just, it's rocking. So I I can't wait to see all these characters art in action and of course she's got her gadgets her lasso her bracelets and her invisible jet which doesn't have art on the card which i think is hilarious well played and then last but in no way less important than the previous three the hero the flash andrea says i personally love the character but i must admit we struggled a lot to find a correct and balanced way to represent his powers within the united system he's not just the fastest man alive but a true ruler of the speed force able to even travel through time thanks to his immense velocity. They say here the Flash can dominate the board with reach and flexibility and even access his speed force aura for incredible protection and extend time. However, he'll need to build up his momentum by drawing and playing the right cards, which might slow down the hero's progress at times. The Flash turned out to be a great combo hero, still useful overall to boost group movement and able to perform incredibly flexible and high action count turns in the second half of the game at the cost of the need to correctly balance out the first part of the game. So if he's momentum-based, it looks like he might start off a little bit 
slower and then as the game goes on you're going to get to play cards that have more and more stuff on them again a really difficult hero to adapt how do you make him different from quicksilver uh did they make him different from quicksilver i think they probably did quicksilver didn't have anything too special or crazy about him right i'm going to assume the flash is going to have at least one card that's a double move that seems like a given. I'm going to assume the Flash also probably has more than one card that just says move to any location and punch there or move to any location and heroic action there. Right? That makes sense. The time thing is interesting, though. I think the time thing is going to work like this. He'll probably have a card that says when you play this card, either A, play a second card after that, which is very unique. We've never seen that happen, but it does add to the momentum thing that Andrea mentioned. Or... He might have a card that says when you play this, delay the next villain turn by one card. So it might just be a case of he's moving so fast, he's moving faster than the villain. Right? That makes sense without breaking the game too much. Another hard character to adapt, though. And again, they have their work cut out for them because the thing with the flashes, there's a lot of the flashes. There are so there's there's Barry Allen, who it looks like we've got here. But like, there's the Wally West Flash. Is that going to be a thing? There's Kid Flash. There's um, oh, what what's her name? Impulse, the 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 young girl. Then there's Reverse Flash, the evil one. There's Jay Garrick, the Golden Age Flash, who's got like the the metal Hermes helmet. DC really legacizes their characters and puts a lot of different people behind the same masks. So how do you make that a thing? How do you make all those flashes play? just a little differently. If anybody's going to find a way to do it, it's going to be Andrea. So now we're taking a look at the villains, starting with Lex Luthor. And they say Lex Luthor has not always just been the main antagonist for Superman, but a threat to the whole Earth, and sometimes even more. All of this while simply being a mere human, a genius with an astonishing ability to formulate complex schemes and deceive his opponents. And being a billionaire helps. The fact that he has like unlimited wealth and resources, probably why we shouldn't let so many real world people have that kind of power, right? But... We still keep doing it for some reason. Always one step ahead of allies and enemies, Lex is often able to pose himself as a hero in order to accomplish his long-term goals and schemes. In this United version, I imagine him summoning his Legion of Doom and trying with their help to appear as a true hero in the eyes of the public. He will spend part of his gameplay actually helping the heroes to complete their missions, or better, pretending to do so. And if he somehow is able, during his villain turn, to fill any of the hero missions, he will appear as a hero in the eyes of the public, thus fulfilling one of his plans and winning the game. This right here sounds like a perfect adaptation of Lex. It's just every time you see Lex Luthor, this is exactly what he's doing. He's putting on this very benevolent facade, right? He's walking around as this billionaire industrialist and more important, this philanthropist who's doing these good things, but at the end of the day, they're not very good things at all. So to adapt that in United, brilliant, brilliant choice. So he's going to be going around. He's going to be rescuing civilians, punching thugs, probably doing a lot of other nasty stuff too. He's probably going to be beating on his own henchmen, the Legion of Doom, which we didn't see because in that uh, that footage, they turned those cards over. So we can't see the artwork for the Legion of Doom yet. But he's going to be kind of superior spider Manning it where he's going to go around and say, look, everybody, look what a nice man I am. I would never hurt any of you. Vote for me as president. And your job is to show the world that his true face is an evil face. And then and then they have that new feature here, which is this red thing with the siren, which I am 99% sure, based on what we've seen now, that means under pressure. So in this card here, this top master plan card, posing as a hero, Lex would rescue all civilians in his location. However, if he's under pressure, thematically, that means that the heroes have ousted him and everybody in the public knows he's evil now. So instead of rescuing civilians, he's not going to bother trying to play the nice guy. He's just going to bam. A spectacular job of, of, of adapting Lex Luthor for this game. That's how you do it. This is how we do it. Montel would be pleased. Now he lightly touches on the Joker. He says what will suffice for the moment is telling that the Joker has a plan to poison everyone with his Joker toxin and that heroes will struggle hard to find him. Have you ever played a shell game? 
that's very Joker too. Uh, Joker likes to hide, you know, he'll wrap himself up in a giant birthday present or something and then there's like six giant birthday presents and he's all like, which one am I in? <laughs> that didn't get touched on too much in Dev Diary 2, but that's okay. Personally, I think Joker is kind of an overrated, overused villain. So I'm okay if they don't really go into detail on him in these Dev Diaries. I'm like, I get it. He's the Joker. He'll blow something up and he'll laugh. There you go. Uh, but Dev Diary 2, we'll take a look at that now quickly. Because that's talking about probably my favorite DC villain ever, Darkseid. Okay, who I still, I can't believe that Darkseid is in this core box and he doesn't have his own villain box you know, the same way that Thanos did. We don't know yet what this is going to look like. We're all assuming it's just a palette swap of DC, but who knows? Maybe DC United won't have those villain boxes like Thanos or Apocalypse or Galactus. I hope they do because those are a lot of fun, but maybe they're going for something different here, which would be kind of interesting to see at least. Like, I, I hope it's good, but the the idea that Darkseid doesn't have his own box is, it, it flummoxes me. And now, according to this update, he doesn't even have henchmen. His threat cards are just pieces of the anti-life equation, and he'll be on the hunt to collect them all, thus winning the game. So it sounds like they're actually going for more of a kingpin treatment with him, where he's just going to hop around and try to land on these spaces, and if he lands on all six pieces of the equation, he gets it and he wins. That's tricky. That's going to be really hard to beat. And I mean, that makes sense. He should be hard. Darkseid should be one of the hardest United villains, period, because it's Darkseid. Andrea says, I believe the fight against Darkseid represents an innovative and challenging playing pattern that will delight United aficionados and entertain players new to the system, making him a real menace, even when confronted by powerful heroes like Superman. Superman has had trouble with Darkseid, so that makes sense. Uh, we really got to see more. I want to see this guy's dashboard. The dashboard will tell all. And the fact that he doesn't have any henchmen, I'm not going to say it makes me sad, but I mean, again, I just go back to what was in my head and I thought that box, that dark side box, which worked just like the Thanos box in terms of you got dark side in there and then you've got Desaad in there and you've got Steppenwolf and Glorious Godfrey and Granny Goodness and they're all henchmen, but they're all also their own separate villains. That was just a beautiful thought and it just it would have worked so well so I don't know if they're still gonna do that or not but the idea that we might not get glorious Godfrey and granny goodness and dark side makes me a little bit sad so I hope I hope they're showing up and I think they will show up eventually if not in this season then in seasons to come but wow really really curious what they're gonna do with this character and then our last but not least villain, the Cheetah, a classic enemy of Wonder Woman. She's probably the villain with the most linear game plan. So Andrea says I would suggest players new to United to face her as the first villain. I like how they do that in every core box. I like how every core box has one villain where they say, start with them. I do that every time I bring the game over to introduce it to a new person. I'm just like, let's, let's fight Red Skull. And then I'll show you the 90 other boxes that you can open. So Cheetah is the quintessential evasive villain and might end up fulfilling her master plan before heroes even have the chance to hit her with a serious punch or two. Let me provide you with a useful hint. Wonder Woman is likely the perfect hero to face her, but if you want to have a real edge, bring along someone who can be faster than a Cheetah to the fight. So she's going to be hard to hit. I'm going to guess that she's going to have light HP, like maybe like 4 or 5 HP tops, but... To actually land a blow on her is going to be really, really difficult. Now the heroes, I'll start with Cyborg, a.k.a. Vic Stone. Players might be surprised by his apparent lack of equipment, the reason being that Cyb is his own equipment. A well-rounded and flexible hero, Victor can provide mobility through his boom tubes, firepower with the Meccano arsenal, and perform incredibly powerful and flexible turns when activating his cybernetic enhancements. Beautiful. Yeah, Cyborg just seems like a solid character. Just, just a really good solid character to have like a lot of little things to add to the mix. He was in my prediction for the core box. Check. So was Cheetah. Check. Cheetah was a big win for me because she's so underplayed as a DC character. And I put her in the core box and I remember thinking, if anybody in here is wrong, it's going to be Cheetah. And it turns out, no, Cheetah's in the core box. I was really, really happy about that. But uh, I was wrong about some other things, including this one. Aquaman, ruler of the seas. Not only does he have one of the most powerful and flexible pieces of equipment in the whole game, the Trident of Poseidon, it can be used to heal himself, damage his foes, or rescue a civilian in danger almost anywhere. And they say this equipment proved to be so good that we had to increase its recharge cost during development not once, but twice. 
His real power comes from the flexibility and reach granted by his Atlantean physiology and life force connection, not to mention the possibility to summon a tidal wave once per game. I want to highlight that once per game, tidal wave, okay? Now, if you look down at Aquaman's cards, which, by the way, the color that they used, perfect. The orange with the green and... Like, whoever picks the colors for the United Heroes cards, again, <laughs> applause. They, they are flawless. But if you look way at the back of that last card, it's hard to read, but it says Tidal Wave. Uh, the, the banner in the orange and the name of the attack says Tidal Wave. And it's got one of those new features that we're seeing on the cards, that yellow text box. And we don't know 100% what that yellow text is, but I'm going to make a guess now because they said tidal wave is something you can do once per game. So I'm going to say that the yellow boxes mean once you perform the action in that yellow box, you have to flip the card over on the timeline, which means it can't be touched or used again. It's like gone, essentially. Uh, it's a one-time big thing, especially because of just what we've seen with Joker. Like it looks like DC is really going to highlight the idea of flipping cards. So I think that's what the yellow means. And that would make sense with Tidal Wave being just something you can only do once. Then Andrea closes the article with a quick look at some of the locations. We did something special with locations here since two of them, Apocalypse and the Hall of Doom, are strictly linked to two villains in the box. This doesn't mean these locations can't be used with other villains, but their negative effects have been tailored to match specific villains' game plans. Apocalypse is specifically designed to break some heroes' gameplay if they need to go there for any reason and make it even easier for Darkseid to KO heroes, which might help them ensure a quick victory. And if you look real close, it says heroes on Apocalypse. Heroes entering this location must either discard one action token or discard one card to the bottom of their deck. Yeah, Apocalypse hurts people. And then in Hall of Doom, you must add two thugs to this location, then you may reveal the top card of the Master Plan deck. Okay, that's not too bad. That's That's got a give and take. Then Andrea says, we wanted the other locations to have helpful end of turn effects, even if some of these, like Gotham and Central, have double edge side effects. Everyone knows that Gotham is a city that seems to make even regular villains a bit more dangerous, and Central City can be so crowded to easily overflow. Another very interesting location will be Atlantis, where you might choose to speed up evacuating the underwater city, thus gaining a precious wild action token, but again at the risk of causing overflow. I like these. These are cool effects. Like, Gotham is a great effect. Any henchman entering play in this location has one extra health may go above starting value. Just because Gotham has a thing. Its villains are really powerful. That's that's cool. That's thematic. And then you can also get a punch token while you're there because people in Gotham like to punch each other. In Atlantis, it says if this location has any empty slot, you may fill it with one crisis token to gain one wild token. So that's tricky because if you have if you don't have somebody who can remove crisis tokens, that's going to start filling up real fast. But a wild token is handy. And then Central City is kind of blocked. You can't really see it. Um, it looks like you can gain tokens there. During setup, if the blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so we can't really tell yet what's going on. But that's the end of Dev Diary 2. And then last but not least, I just want to shed a little bit of light on the box art reveal, which is this right here. So the box art is decidedly darker and a bit sleeker than Marvel United's boxes. Uh, Marvels are more colorful. They have kind of like a rounded thing to their art, kind of like exploding outward, whereas this one is vertical lines and kind of a darker, more shadowy tone. I will admit, I do prefer the way the Marvel ones look. They just, they pop, the colors and everything just pop so beautifully. But this is very, very gorgeous too. I mean, the artwork in this game is what makes the game so special. It says Core Box in tiny, tiny letters way up in the top right corner. So I wonder if the other boxes are going to say things in the top right corner as well, or if they're just doing that with Core Boxes. The boxes are a thing where you kind of need to see them all to see how they work, right? Uh, but this is a great piece of artwork, and I look forward to seeing what the expansions look like. But yeah, that's the box. Not too shabby. So that's all there is so far, all we know about DC Superheroes United. All those characters are the 10 characters in the core box. Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, Aquaman, Cyborg, Cheetah, Lex Luthor, Joker, and Darkseid. No anti-heroes in that core box, which is really interesting. Again, that's it feels like they're catering this to newer fans, so they're not bombarding newer fans with everything all at once. But rest assured, like, don't worry, we are getting anti-heroes in this season. It's just a matter of time, and they're going to make a big deal of it. Like, look, you can be a purple person, and it'll probably be Harley Quinn, who is the first one they announce, because it just makes sense. So, it's time to end things 
with the game we've been playing here that we haven't played in a long time. It's a game called What's That Movie, where I am going to put characters on the screen from Marvel United, and your job is to guess which movie I'm talking about based on which characters I put on the screen. So you have to look at those characters and say, hmm, which actors have played those characters before, and then which of all these actors have been together in one movie. And as an example, we'll look back at the previous answers and give a shout out to our previous winner. And our previous winner was the person who won the first time too. That would be Screw Top Reviews. Congratulations, Screw Top Reviews. You guessed correctly uh, for the most part. Uh, I'll, I'll put an asterisk on that because uh, I do, I did forget to leave out a crucial rule of the game. So I'm going to give the victory to Screw Top Reviews. So the first one that we showed was Wasp, Doctor Strange, Magneto, and Ronin. And the answer to that was The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smaug. Because in that movie, you have Evangeline Lilly, who is the Wasp. You have Benedict Cumberbatch, who's Doctor Strange. Ian McKellen, who is Magneto. And you have Lee Pace, who played Ronan the Accuser. Right? All those actors appeared in The Hobbit. There you go. That's how it works. The next one I showed was Daredevil and Kingpin. Now, screw top reviews, you guessed the early 2000s movie Daredevil. Technically, you're right. So I'm going to give this to you because that's on me. I failed to bring up a rule that is kind of important and I'm going to bring it up now. So moving forward, we're all on the same page. The rule is the movies that I'm trying to get you to guess are not superhero movies. Okay? They're not Marvel or DC movies. Let me let me say that. So even though you're correct, it, Daredevil and Kingpin did appear in Daredevil, the answer I was looking for was Armageddon by Michael Bay, because Armageddon stars both Ben Affleck, Daredevil, and Michael Clark Duncan, who was the Kingpin. There you go. Moving forward, we're going to all be on the same page about that. No more Marvel or DC movies are going to be the answers. Next, I showed Shang-Chi, Storm, and Super Scroll. And the answer to that is the Barbie movie. Simu Liu was in it. Uh, the girl who played Storm in the new trilogies, like X-Men Apocalypse, she was in it. And the guy who played Super Scroll in Secret Invasion is also one of the Kens. And then last we have Hobgoblin, Red Hulk, and Claw. They were played by the actors Mark Hamill, Harrison Ford, and Andy Serkis. And all three of those gentlemen appeared in Star Wars The Force Awakens. So congratulations to screw top reviews for guessing that correctly again. Now we're gonna move on to our third one and I'm making these ones a little bit more difficult so I've decided we're gonna try to do some giveaways here. We're gonna try to do a prize. I've never done a giveaway before so it might be a bit of a slow process, bear with me, but I will give away a free copy of my novel, We Were Wizards Book One, Seekers of the Stones to the first person who jumps into the comments and guesses all four of these movies correctly. So remember, none of them are going to be DC or Marvel movies. So, with that being said, let's start playing. Movie number one is going to be Gamora, Thor, Hulk, and Spider-Man. Movie number two, Captain Marvel, Captain America, Punisher. Number three, War Machine. Storm, Juggernaut, Wolverine, and number four, Moon Knight, Thanos, Drax. All right, there you go. Let's play What's That Movie? Chime in in the comments. The first person who does so is the winner. And I think that'll be all for today. Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody, here on Digital Charcuterie, where we continue to make the wait for Marvel United Multiverse a little bit shorter and a whole lot sweeter. I'll see you all next time, my friends. Until then, may you continue to be the masters of your own universe.